Okay, um, this is a short little lecture about um, PCR and, and a little bit about sequencing. Um, I, I, I recorded this because I sense there are a lot of questions still about PCR, what it's all about, and questions about um, this phrase, uh, taxonomic markers, and what's that uh, all about. Um, so this is kind of a review and goes over the same material, perhaps in a bit different words, um, but perhaps you'll see and understand what um, uh, I'm talking about when I t uh, mentioned um, taxonomic, taxonomic markers and the, and the like. And I'll have a bit more information, one slide, uh, about sequencing because a couple of you had asked about that as well. So um, I want to emphasize that um, we're talking about um, an approach, a method, for looking at um, ecological problems. So the focus is still on ecology and on marine biology. Um, we can consider these organisms as organisms in and of themselves, and, and molecular approaches, of course, are very important and essential for looking at their genetic material and for looking at their physiology. Um, but here we're interested in, in the ecology of these organisms and how they're uh, surviving and, and reproducing in the oceans. And one of the problems that we talked about was just how we can identify them, um, knowing that there are problems with using just their morphology. And one specific example that we talked a little bit about um, is the problem of invasive species. We're going to talk a bit more about that and how um, these molecular approaches have been useful for figuring out where these, these foreigners came from. Um, we've also talked a little bit about, well, I, I guess I haven't really talked so much about how we can deduce evolutionary relationships among organisms. And of course, that applies not only to organisms in the oceans, but also on land as well. And in case you're wondering, that's Darwin in his younger, well, maybe not so young years. Um, and one of the, uh, t I got a t-shirt that has uh, Darwin um, with a little kind of revolutionary beret there um, to illustrate or talk about how important um, evolution is and, and thinking about um, organisms and the relationships um, among them. Anyway, um, so molecular approaches and DNA sequences in, in, in particular have been very useful for looking at evolutionary um, uh, relationships among organisms. And then finally, something that we won't get into at all is you can use um, various molecular approaches to get insights into processes, um, and especially biogeochemical processes carried out by microbes, which are rather difficult to look at by more traditional methods. So um, I mentioned that the, the, the heart of these molecular approaches is basically sequencing. And one approach is basically sequenced directly the DNA that's becoming more and more common as the, as the costs of sequencing have decreased over the last 10 years or so. Um, but still, it's very common to only look at one gene that uh, is of interest and that has taxonomic and phylogenetic information in that gene. And the way that we get at that one gene is this very magical approach called uh, PCR, polymerase chain reaction. And, and what I'm about to say um, and talk about now is, again, a review of what we talked about already, but it, I hope that it will now make a bit more sense. And I'm going to try to boil it down to what's the absolutely minimum that you need to know as a budding marine biologist. So the, the whole point of, of PCR is to take a very complex you know, assortment of DNA that has all the genes of the organisms, millions of those genes, well, actually, um, if it's one organism, like the, the uh, this uh, killer whale here, it may have only about 10 no, no, more, I don't know what the killer whale has, but we have, uh, humans only have about 20,000 genes or so, which is a, maybe 22,000, I can't remember. But it's only that number, you know, roughly 20,000 genes. Um, killer whales probably don't have much different number of genes be also, being also mammals. Um, so anyway, it's, it's a lot of genes, a lot of DNA. And in, in more complex situations where you, if, for example, if you're dealing with a microbial assemblage or perhaps even zooplankton, you may have all sorts of different organisms present there. So that the challenge then is to find that one gene that you're interested in. Um, and how do you do that? Well, PCR is, is the approach and, and, and way to go. So I talked about the common taxonomic markers that are used. Two of them um, um, are 16S ribosomal RNA genes. Um, and the genes for um, cytochrome oxidase 1. Why do we use these genes? Because they're found in all organisms. Now, they are associated with bacteria, um, but they're 
um, but remember that because of, especially the 16 S is found with bacteria, but uh, remember that the organelles of eukaryotes have DNA reflecting their, their endosymbiotic origin. And so what these markers are looking at is really the mitochondria in these organisms. Um, and we'll talk later about other genes that are found in the chloroplasts, which are useful, of course, for looking at plants. But the key of these, of these taxonomic marker genes is that they're found in all the organisms that you're interested in. Kind of, kind of basic, right? If it's not there, you, it's not going to be any use. So that's the, kind of the one, number one criteria for, for calling a taxon, taxonomic marker gene, a, a, giving it that name. It has to be found in all those organisms. Um, and the other very useful and important uh, property of these genes, and more generally of all taxonomic marker genes, is that they have regions that vary from highly conserved to highly variable. And some of you had questions about that, so let me try to explain that again. So the, cat, the, the conserved regions are those sequences within that gene in the targeted organism that are basically all the same in all the organisms that you're, you're interested in. And I'm going to give an example of that in a minute that's kind of a small um, small kind of just there to break up the slide, but I'm going to blow that up and explain it in a minute. Um, as opposed to the variable regions. And the variable regions are, as the name implies, um, they're different. So the different organisms have different sequences. You need both regions, um, especially uh, for PCR, you need the conserved regions because that's where the primers go. Now, what may not have been clear is that the primers are something that you design and you're adding. You know enough about the, this region that you're looking at, um, this, this gene, that you can design these primers, usually on the order of 20 bases or so, um, that are found in all the, all the genes from all the organisms, so because they're based on the conserved region. And those are essential for PCR. The variable regions are necessary because, you know, if, if, if everything was conserved, it would be totally useless for looking at uh, uh, different organisms. It, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference if they're all the same. But it's because of the variable regions um, that, they, that we can tell the difference between organisms. And the 60S region in particular has, has some variation that's um, uh, a little bit less conserved. And so organisms that are um, uh, uh, more distant related will have uh, vary in that region. And then they can have other regions that um, reflect more recent evolutionary changes. So anyway, you need both regions, both the, the conserved regions because of the, necess the necessity for the primers to find these genes among the complex mixture of all the genes that are present there. You need the variable regions to uh, tell the difference between organisms and sequences. So just to illustrate these variable regions, here's a picture of the 16S ribosomal RNA gene um, for three different organisms. Now this turns out not quite three different organisms, um, but let's say it's just three for, for the sake of this um, uh, lecture. And, um, um, and, and my, you know, my quick Googling around for a convenient di diagram. Okay, so this is a lot more information you need to know. Um, what, I, what you really need to know about variable and conserved is what's given on the previous slide. Um, but I thought it would help to look at a bit more concrete example of, of variable and regions and, and conserved regions. So basically what you're looking at is the sequence for, for three organisms, oops, three organisms um, that, um, that for the 16S ribosome RNA gene, the rRNA gene. And, and the convention here is that only the sequence for only one is given, and if there's exactly the same, basically you see this dots here, you see the little dots, those indicate that that organism C has that sequence as well um, that's given in A. Um, and the dashes indicate that there is a deletion, which we're not going to get into. So what you're looking for here then is all, this indicates that those sequences for all three organisms are exactly the same. In this case, C had a bit different base at that particular location. And again, near the uh, base 60 has a, 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 a cytosine and a thymine instead of a ad, adenine and, and a cytosine. So, so you can see some differences. So overall, for this region, it's pretty, pretty much the same. And you go over here, again, pretty much the same. You know, again, a couple differences in C. But then there are these variable regions where you see more differences, more differences popping up, especially in C. And then here's the variable region, too. A lot more differences again. 
and so on. It turns out the ribosomal RNA gene has nine different variable regions um, to it. And, and now we, with the current methods, we tend to be focusing on variable region three and four uh, for some of the work that, that we've been doing on, on microbial diversity. So anyway, that's, that's just an illustration of, of, of conserved and variable regions. But, um, all taxonomic genes have to have that, especially if you're going to use PCR. Okay, so what's PCR? Polymerase chain reaction. So again, um, let's, we're going to boil this down to the really, really basics. And, um, and in a minute, I'll show you some, uh, a bit more complicated diagram. And on the web, and I'll give you a couple websites, there are tons of different diagrams and videos and so on that explain PCR. But I thought it was useful for you to see, a, you know, just really, again, the, the, the kind of the essence of the idea. And the essence of the idea starts off with the observation that, again, these genes, um, in fact, all genes generally have these conserved regions. That is, they're really the same or very similar among different organisms. They differ, they, and in fact, they have to differ within the um, one organism's gene, um, but um, the, the two sites, but uh, they are conserved um, among all organisms or all targeted organisms that you're interested in. And then in between these two sites, so this is the five prime and the three prime end of the gene, there are the, there's the region that's more variable. And so what we want to do then is design our primers, and this is something we have to do. We can, you know, either look it up in the previous publication, or maybe you have to do some uh, preliminary work on your own. You design these primers. These are bits of DNA, about 20 bases in length or so. You get a company to make those for you. And those are the ingredients, uh, among other things, that are needed to do PCR. And then you add uh, uh, an enzyme, it's called TAC polymerase, that makes the DNA. And um, uh, just a little bit of, fit, a bit of a footnote about TAC polymerase, it's from a uh, bacterium that was actually isolated by a microbial ecologist in Yellowstone. It, it was a, what's really important about this enzyme, it's, it's able to withstand really high heat, 95 degrees, almost boiling. This polymerase then, this, this enzyme, makes lots of DNA, lots of DNA, with the primers and the other ingredients that you give it. And there's a little bit of magic here um, that I won't go into. That, no, it's actually not that miraculous. Um, uh, as I said, and I'm showing in a minute, there's, there's diagrams that explain what actually happens here. But you don't really need to know that. I, for this course, you need, don't need to know how it actually works. The important thing to note is that the end result is you get lots of this chunk of DNA um, between the two primers, um, the five prime one and the three prime one. You get lots of it. You get lots of it. Um, you get zillions of different copies of it, as is the, to use the word. And, and because of, uh, you have lots of it, you can now do other things with it, like sequence it. Now, they, the, so again, I want to emphasize that this DNA, this is important and useful when there's many other things going around in, inside that sample. And because of the specificity of the primers, that it matches only these two regions, um, uh, the DNA polymerase then works only on this part of the gene between those two primers, and you get this product that's formed, lots of copies of that product, and then you can go on to the analyses. So that's, that's the kind of a very simple version of PCR. Here's a bit more complicated version of PCR that I found on the web. Um, yeah, I think you should know this as, a, as all biologists should know it, but I'm not going to ask you to reproduce this. Um, I certainly would expect you to know this version of the, of the, uh, of the method that you need to have these primers, you need to have DNA polymerase. The end result is lots of different, uh, lots of the copied, uh, lots of the targeted gene fragment that you're after. Um, and as I mentioned, there are many different uh, diagrams and even small videos. One has a pretty good soundtrack, uh, no, no words at all, just kind of explains uh, what's happening, no narrative. Um, another one is a bit drier. Um, so if these don't work for you, um, you can go to Google and find other ones. Okay, and, and one final slide about sequencing. Again, um, this is more than what you really need to know. Um, uh, I, I thought it was important since a couple of you had asked about hearing more about sequencing, I thought I should give you, again, the very basics of it. Um, I'm not gonna tell you how it's done, 
I'm just going to give you a couple buzzwords about um, different ways of doing it. Um, it. I don't think it's important for you to understand, for this course at least, how it's done. Um, but anyway, the, 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 the older method, and that's still around, was developed by Fed, Frederick uh, Sanger back in 1977, um, is, is called the Sanger Sequencing Method. Um, it's still um, used today because um, it still gives, um, although there's one method that gives a little bit longer sequence reads, um, Sanger gives a roughly a thousand bases. Um, also, in comparison to the other newer methods, um, it has less errors uh, associated with it. So, um, so it gives a longer, more sequence per run than what we see these other methods. But because it's 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 slow to, to uh, not, without going into details and explaining why it's slow, suffice to say it is slow, which means it's it's relatively expensive. And then fast forward to today, or well, um, the pyro sequence method has been around for several years now. Um, there are many other methods um, that are generally put in under the umbrella next generation, or to be really cool, next gen approaches. And two of which that you may encounter. Um, one is called 454. 454 was the company that had um, brought this method called pyro sequencing to uh, to the commercial market, and it, it gives a lot more sequences than Sanger. Um, but you can see that the uh, the downside it has uh, re relatively a small read length, and so that um, becomes a problem when analyzing the data. And then probably the method that's used the most today um, is, called, is, is by a company called Illumina. Again, the, the read length is only about 250 bases, um, but you get a lot more of them. You get a lot more of them. And so it's relatively cheap to uh, sequence um, a gene and, and sequence even an organism. And so you, know, you think, well, if a gene is roughly 1,000 bases, how do we get the whole gene? Well, you get the whole gene because you're making many, you're, you're doing lots of sequences, and you put the, the different fragments that you sequence together in the computer. And so that's what's, you know, why I have this um, uh, picture of, the, of a couple of guys now analyzing uh, today some computer, uh, some sequence information. So anyway, that's, that's I think, a um, couple of the buzzwords that you, sh you probably should know um, about for, with regard to sequences. There's a lot more to be said. It's a huge field. Um, it, as I mentioned in the lecture for uh, Tuesday, it's being driven by not unfortunately or fortunately um, ecology and b marine biology, but it's being driven by the biomedical field and the applications to understand in human health. But we can benefit from all the applications and, and uh, developments in new technology for sequencing our organisms and using it to look at important problems in the, about the ecology of these marine organisms. Okay, so I hope that is a bit more helpful um, about what PCR is uh, all about and um, how we sequence.